Good evening and welcome to the Mormon and Yeshiva. Um, tonight's pro, uh, presentation is going to be on Lehi's vision of the heavens, some astronomical symbols in the Book of Mormon, part one. I'd like to just stop here for a moment and take a look at our fair use disclaimer. Again, um, the purpose of these presentations is just for educational purpose and uh, for exploration, so I hope you'll all enjoy. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Psalms 19.1 You know, it's amazing to me as we look through the many symbols in the scriptures, we often miss the astronomical symbols that are in uh, both the Bible, the, whether it be Old Testament, New Testament, and even the Book of Mormon. Uh, we sometimes read right over them, not realizing that in it's revealing to us a very ancient pattern of prophecy among the house of Israel and how their worldview developed. And among that worldview, among the teachings that are in that worldview, was the idea of astronomy. Uh, it, it, it basically gives us, you know, looking at the stars, looking above, it basically sets a, a background for much of the, the visionary works that you see in the, uh, in the various books of Scripture. So tonight, what I'd like to do is try to um, take a look at some of the things, just to start here, in some of the symbols that we see in the Book of Mormon. And strangely enough, it actually begins in the first chapter. In chapter 1 of Nephi, it says, And it came to pass that he returned, he being Lehi, returned to his own house at Jerusalem. And he cast himself upon his bed, being overcome with the spirit and the things which he had seen. And being thus overcome with the spirit, he was carried away in a vision, even that he saw the heavens open. And he thought he saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. 1 Nephi 1, 7 to 8. So when Lehi is taking a look, you know, looking here, he's actually seeing the literal heavens open in a sense, you know, and he's being able to see the idea of the, the, the phraseology of open means that not only could he possibly visibly see the heavens, but that the heavens themselves, their constellations and stars were open to his understanding. It says he thought he saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels. What is often not known among the Western world is that in the ancient Israel, stars were sometimes seen as angelic beings, so or the voices of angels. Sometimes they served as symbols, and sometimes they were, in the Hebraic cultures, they were thought to be uh, actual angels. Whatever the case may be, we can see that, you know, in a sense, if he's looking up at the heavens and he's seeing the throne of God, whatever constellation he may be looking at, that it's surrounded with numberless concourses of angels or stars, as if they were in the attitude of singing and praising their God. And what is interesting is that in ancient Hebrew and uh, the ancient Israelite traditions, uh, one of the things it talks about is that the, the stars actually sing or emit uh, praise. So the concept of angels and stars being connected in symbolism is not too far off. So let's discuss the throne of heaven. You know, there's a lot of conjecture about the throne of heaven. And um, I'd be remiss to say that there are actually several traditions in uh, among varying sects of Jews of what, where is this throne of heaven? Um, can we even see it? Uh, is it, you know, in this, in this dimension, if you will? Whatever the case may be, there are some constellations that uh, actually either point us to or may actually be what it was called the throne of heaven. Uh, one of these, which I find to be the most uh, impressive of them all is regarding uh, the star Sirius in the constellation we call Canis Major. You know, it's interesting that in Mormonism, which is uh, very unique in this way, is the fact that Joseph Smith revealed something about regarding a, a, a star or a, a, a celestial body that he called Kolob. Well, in Hebrew, uh, if you take the, the actual you know, consonants of the word kolob. It's kaf lamed, uh, kuf lamed bet, 
And in the end, um, what's interesting is that the B is actually in Hebrew would be pronounced as a V. So Kelev, and it's the Hebrew word for dog. So it is quite possible that you know Kelev and Kolob may actually be one and the same. And what would it be? Well, in the ancient world, um, Kolob, or the dog star, or the dog Canis Major, uh, which pointing to Sirius, which there's a lot of symbolism in both the Egyptian, Arabic, uh, Hebrew cultures, and even Sumeria regarding this particular star. So it, it's a really good candidate for potentially being the throne of God or Kolob, which is closest to the residence of God. So Kela means in Hebrew like the heart, which shares common roots with other Semitic roots. Semitic root, Semitic root words. So like it could be something in the heart, something in the middle, or in the center. Um, but the idea being is that I find it interesting that here Joseph Smith in his uh, in the 1800s, very little education, is actually pointing to this particular word as being nearest to the throne of God. And in the ancient world, we see a, a very common parallel amongst Canis Major or, you know, the, the dog star, if, if you will, Sirius. Um, so it is a possibility. It's something that, you know, we, it's a potential that could we could look to as Kolob or Kelev. What's also interesting is that in certain traditions of, uh, like such as the, the Qumran community, uh, as well as some of the other Yemenite traditions, um, the Jubilee year was considered to be a 50, which was considered a 50, like a 50, 49 year plus one or 50 year cycle. And among one tradition, it was that it was the cycle of Sirius B revolving around Sirius A, which is interesting because Sirius B is really not visible to the naked eye anymore without a telescope. So perhaps it's, it's a throwback to a much more ancient era when potentially um, that Sirius B was visible to the naked eye and that could be seen. Um, there are other tribes, certain in Egyptian tribes, as well as the Dogon of Africa, who still maintain the, an understanding and a knowledge that scientists still to this day can't fully figure out where they got it from, of the idea of Sirius and Sirius B revolving around Sirius A. But there are certain traditions that talk about um, the idea of Sirius B, if you will, the star that revolves around Sirius A, being the uh, marker for what could potentially be the Jubilee cycle among sage in Israel. Can't say 100% sure, but it certainly gives us cause to question. And that's what we're doing here. We're asking questions and we're exploring. So it may be that Sirius, the star Sirius, uh, could be a very good candidate for what we call Tolab. Uh, and if it's not, that's okay too. I guess God will reveal that in his own time. But I do find it interesting that among uh, many of the ancient cultures, we see the star Sirius or the dog star or Kelev or Kolab, potentially, um, being a, a, a celestial body of significance. So again, is it possible that Kolab and Kelev, uh, is there, that's the Sirius connection? Could be. Kolab signifies the first creation nearest to the celestial or the residence of God. In other words, it's not that Kolob may actually be the residence of God. It's a celestial body that's nearest to the residence of God. Uh, first in government and last pertain to the measurement of time. Um, what's interesting is that there now, I, you know, to be fair, there are other other ancient traditions. One identifying the constellation Orion, but you know, to find Sirius and to find the constellation Orion, they're two very close bodies that are very close together. So it is a potential. There may be some relation. But whatever the case may be, um, it shows that there's a precedent for astronomical symbols, both in the foundation of Mormonism and in other scriptures. So in Hebrew, we would say that Lehi would have a vision of the Maserot, or the, what we often call the Zodiac, the 12 major constellations that we see from the earth, the brightest constellations. And it says here, and it came to pass that he saw one descending out of the midst of heaven. And he beheld that his luster was above that of the, noon, of the sun at noonday. Now, it is possible there are several stars, such as, you know, that, that take the name in Hebrew of uh, the lustrous one, the, um, you know, some one of which is in actually Canis Major. 
Um, so we may be looking at an astronomical symbol that perhaps Lehi was looking at when he beheld the heavens. But what's interesting is that um, we see, he sees this this you know being or this you know he saw one descending out of the midst of heaven. So the question remains that you know we often think of okay he's having this open vision of of Christ coming right down out of heaven. And that may not be all of the story. It may be that as he's you know opening his visions to the heaven, as he's open and receiving understanding regarding the actual heavens above, that God is directing his attention, which would be very typical of the ancient Israelite prophetic process of viewing the uh, uh, the celestial bodies, and he sees a particular celestial body as if it were descending out of the midst of heaven, and then of course whose luster was above that of the noonday sun. And he says, and he also saw 12 others following him. Now, traditionally, it says in their brightness, uh, excuse me, and their brightness did exceed that of the stars in the firmament. What's interesting is that, you know, again, we, we attribute this to a picture, if we will, of, of Christ and his 12 apostles. But originally in vision and in the prophetic tradition of ancient Israel, he actually may be seeing a particular celestial body and then surrounding it, the, the 12 signs of the zodiac the brightest stars. And how we know that is because it says that, that, that their brightness did exceed that of the stars in the firmament. So in other words, he's comparing the 12 others that followed him and their brightness did exceed that of the stars of the firmament. So he's paralleling the 12 with the stars in the firmament. And what would be the 12 in ancient Israelite astronomical or astrotheological terms? Uh, it would be what we would call the zodiac, the 12 constellations. So imagine not only is Lehi getting it open to his mind uh, a vision of the Messiah and the 12 apostles, but he may also be seeing um, a celestial body whose brightness is above the noonday sun, if you will, uh, exceeding that of the stars or the, the Maserot or the zodiacal signs surrounding that particular body. So he could be looking at a particular celestial body that he's able to visibly see in the heavens and God opens his mind to it. It's very Israelite. Um, again, and this is, and they came down and went forth upon the face of the earth. And the first came and stood before my father and gave unto him a book and bade him that he should read. So in a visionary sense, you know, we often get the description. We think that a particular one of the 12 or an angel came from amongst the, those, um, those 12 that came with the the you know the one that descended, whose luster was above that of the noonday sun, and they may have come and and we think of we see it like the picture drawn that they came and gave him a book, but in astronomical terms or astrotheological terms, he may also be viewing a particular constellation that came down up to the earth or fell below the horizon of the earth. Okay, so imagine you're seeing just like this picture here, you're seeing the various constellations, and as the you know as we revolve in our in our 24-hour process, the uh, constellations begin to fall below the horizon. So it's the it actually expresses an Hebrew idea of uh, the constellations you know went forth upon the face of the earth. In other words, they came down and they begin to drop drop or fall below the horizon. There's another, uh, you know, in the book of Revelation, another type of phraseology that's used. It says, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. I believe it may also be in Matthew as well. But um, the idea is when the stars of heaven fall to the earth, in our modern culture, we think, oh, great, we're going to get pelted by an asteroid or, or ginormous planetoid or asteroid type thing, and we're doomed. But in actuality, it's a Hebraic expression, basically just saying that the constellations fell below the horizons. It's a, it's a picturesque way in Hebrew of saying um, basically that the, these constellations, he's having a vision using, you know, with the constellations that he's being revealed what their meanings are. And these constellations literally in their natural revolution fell down below the horizon of the earth, uh, or in a sense, the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Uh, of course, and gave him a book that he should read. Now, here's the interesting thing. He, you know, in in some ways, it may have been an actual, you know, a visionary book, but at the same time, what's interesting is that this particular, um, in, in a Hebraic thought, this particular uh, constellation 
gave unto him a message. In other words, something that he saw gave him a, a, a message that he should read. Okay, so in addition, we, we often think of seeing just the visionary aspect of it in the sense of a person coming and giving him a literal book or scroll like we would think. And that's and that, I think that's part of it. But in a more ancient and traditional sense, he's looking at the celestial bodies and this particular um, this particular constellation as it came and stood before him, as it fell to, right before his sight to the horizon, begins to reveal him, itself to him. And he begins to see something more. So it doesn't have to be a one or the other idea. Was it was he actually seeing a, you know, an actual apostle come and give him this? Could be. Was he also just, just seeing the constellations? Well, that could be. But I tend to think it's both. Because I usually think that what happens is in these in these visionary ideas is that one one aspect of their culture opens up and, and reveals another. So it is not uncommon in, in Israelite thought to, to, to look upon the heavens and the heavens begin to contain mysteries, stories, prophecies, if you will. Um, they may be stories of the ancient world, something of the present, like a warning or the future. It's not like, you know, astrology in the sense of what we think of in our culture. It's the idea that a, a particular prophet sits before these symbols that no man can alter. No one can alter the constellations in the heavens. And so he's, it, it's a tool or mechanism why, whereby God can use these things they're familiar with to reveal much greater truths. And if you think about it, it's a great way to keep mankind from altering prophecies if we know the, the source of the symbols. That many of these symbols come from their viewpoint here on earth looking into the heavens. And then it gives a, an op a greater meaning. So uh, to me, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome to be able to consider the fact that God uses these multi-dimensional uh, aspects of both of, of his creation, not only to view the heavens above, which, which demonstrate his glory, but to use those things to communicate to the mind of a prophet, you know, great messages meant just for him so that he may record and warn others. Or perhaps like, you know, the uh, the Magi, if you will, the, the, the wise men who came from the, the east, who saw these particular astronomical symbols and came looking for a messiah. It's not much difference. The, uh, the astronomical tradition of ancient Israel is very old, predates it, and has been around for a while. Some knowledge has been lost, but also much has been preserved. So as it came to pass that as he read, he was filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And, he, and this is what this particular message or this particular seeing this particular constellation or celestial body uh, was revealed to him that when he saw this, this was the particular message. Basically saying, you know, woe, or in Hebrew, oi, unto Jerusalem, for I have seen thine abominations. Yea, and many things did my father read concerning Jerusalem, that it should be destroyed, and the inhabitants thereof, many should perish by the sword, and many should be carried away captive into Babylon. So while it seems strange to us that God would use the symbols of astronomical bodies, um, it's actually something that has been throughout, uh, very, very dominant, you know, throughout Israelite history. Uh, it's a science that I think we are beginning to rediscover, hopefully one day restored in its fullness. Um, but I think it gives us an idea into their mind and in their culture, because while, while in our, our culture, we're, we're pretty much looking at like television and those kind of things. And we and in our modern cities, we can't even see the stars anymore. Yet if we go out uh, away from the cities, we're able to to look at the heavens and see the Milky Way and the, the stars that shoot and the, um, you know, crossing across the sky. Uh, you know, I had an opportunity one time to go out to the West Desert out in Utah and uh, camp out overnight with some friends. And I was amazed to see the beauty of the heavens. And I kind of want sometimes wonder if that's, you know, when you see all the, the celestial bodies in, 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 you know, full color and just bright, brightness that you don't see in the cities. Um, you know, it, it makes you look at things differently. It makes you begin to look at the heavens in a very different way. And so many of these celestial bodies present astronomical symbols. And these symbols open up to us 
or can op open up to us uh, stories of both past, present, and future. And of course, when we're filled with the Spirit of God, it begins to give us an understanding or the interpretation of like in Lehi's case, of the particular celestial body he's seeing. And then he translates that, in a sense, and God reveals to his to his mind that there's a correlation between, you know, these celestial bodies and a uh, one who comes down with 12 others. So is it, you know, a particular celestial body with the zodiac? Yes. Is it Christ with his 12 apostles? Yes. Both are correct. And one should not take away from the other. The reality is one should magnify the other and see, you know, that God is much more in control of things. And especially in the heavens, the symbols that mankind cannot alter, um, then we, he, you know, we want to think we can control everything in our world. But I think God shows us that yeah, he has different plans. So that's just a brief teaching of Lehi's visions of the heavens. It's part one. I'll have a couple other parts of different things, different astronomical symbols that we'll find in the Book of Mormon uh, over the next few weeks. But I hope you've enjoyed this and uh, that it's been edifying to you. Thank you and uh, have a good day.